is why isn't Flask async? And if you'd like to follow along with the slides, you can find them at pgjones.dev forward slash talks. Okay, just a little about me before we get started. So you can find me via my avatar, which looks like this. Uh, I'm pgjones.dev, where you can find links to pretty much everything. I'm also pgjones at GitHub and GitLab. There's an extra D for Twitter. I'm a maintainer of the Palettes projects, most notably Flask and Verksug. I'm also an author of Quart and Hypercon and a maintainer of the Hyper projects. But that's enough about me. Let's move on to the talk. So before we can get started why Flask is an async, let's try and define what we mean by async. So async is concurrency via event loops. So what this means is that uh, we're running multiple tasks concurrently notably not in parallel, although it seems that way, uh, using a single CPU. Now this is quite nice because it keeps the CPU active, as I'm going to show in a second, so it's more efficient when you've got I.O. So let's take a uh, event loop that has three tasks and let's start running it. So task one is going to start running until it needs to do some I.O., at which point it's going to yield control back to the event loop. The event loop is going to iterate through the tasks until it finds one it can run, task two. And it runs that until it needs to do I.O. And it yields back to event loop. And the same thing happens. And so task three starts running. And you can see this is really nice because it keeps the CPU busy whilst running these tasks. And it's keeping the CPU busy whilst these tasks are waiting I.O. I, when they normally just block the CPU because they've got nothing to do. So this is very nice. So this is one definition of async. And Flask has supported async event loops for a long time. They're based on green nets, so instead of calling them tasks, they're called green threads. And uh, event and event net are two flavors of the event loop that are pretty commoner, common. Sorry, And there are others, and they work, and this works really well. There are great production systems based on this. So this is, I think, not what we mean when we say, why is Flask async? Another definition, this is becoming the more common one, I think, is that async is supporting async await. This means that if you have a coroutine, you can await it, which means you now need a coroutine function, async def, to do so. And specifically for Flask, uh, this means that you'd want to await something in your view function, and Flask does not support this. I think it's good to just emphasize this little snippet here, because I think this is inherently what people want to do. They want to be able to await something, whether it's something could be a, a new library that's quite exciting, or maybe a new library that's only really supported using async await. This is, I think, what people would like to do. Okay. Another definition of async is being an ASCII framework, ASGI. And what this means is that the framework itself, the Flask app, needs to be called this way. So it needs to be called, passing in a scope, a receive and a send. And then if we take a very simple example where we just reply, this is what the app should do. This is effectively the gateway interface for ASCII. Now, Flask does not support the ASCII interface. It is a Whiskey app. You can use Whiskey to ASCII adapters or middleware though, which I'll talk about later. But inherently, this is how Flask is called. It's called with an environment and a start response, the Whiskey interface. So it doesn't support ASCII. So I think it's good to kind of sum this up by saying that Flask is async, but it does not support async await. So uh, in the kind of modern, if you will, usage of async, it's Flask is not async. But of course, you could do everything using green nets and event net and event. And I really want to emphasize that works very well. And uh, there's nothing wrong with it. So with that definition in mind, let's talk about attempts to make Flask async. And uh, I've picked out two because I can still reference them. But there was a third one, which I'll briefly talk about here, where work started to convert Verx like, into an async and then an async toolbox and then Flask on top of it. I can't find it anymore, but that's the closest I found previous to the current work to make Flask async. But let's focus on the ones I can tell you about. So you can use async run directly like this. So your view function now has an inner coroutine function that does the awaiting. And you run your inner function, coroutine function in the a, using async here run, get the result and return that. So this works. Uh, if you type, write this today, it will work. It has some problems though. 
And they are, I think it's fair to say, that is not pleasant to write. Uh, in fact, I think it's not pleasant to write or really to read. I don't particularly uh, like this, especially if you can imagine that when you put all the actual logic you need in there, it's going to get a bit messy. The other problem is that it's not going to integrate well with greenlit event loops. So what's going to happen is the greenlit event loop is going to come and run this function. It's going to come to this line and run it. But it's not going to know that you're doing IO in this async event loop. And it's not going to yield to the greenlit based event loop. So this is just going to block. And uh, for those of you experienced running, uh, say, like password hashing, like you, you know that something takes up a lot of the CPU, something that blocks, it's going to be going to be noticeable. So this is a problem. So another attempt that was quite good at the time is AOHCP, uh, the Flask AOHCP extension. And if you look at this, so this is the pre Python 3.5 syntax where you had to use a dec uh, yeah a decorator to make things async and use yield from instead of await. So if you just imagine this is await, and this becomes the keyword async then it does exactly what you'd want, right? It has that interface that I spoke about earlier that you can await something in a view function simply by wrapping your app in this extension, AOHTP. So this is all pretty good, I think, except it also has some issues. Currently, of course, it's no longer maintained and, and doesn't work and may not have actually worked at the time. But uh, the other problems are it required uses of AOHTP as a server. So you had to change your setup. And it doesn't integrate with GreenNet event loops. Not that you could really use it with GreenNet event loops because you had to use AOHCP. So if you wanted to use this, you had major changes to your setup to do so. So uh, I don't think it was particularly good. So what makes async fast difficult? Well, I first say that Flask is widely used with GreenNets and this cannot break. So no matter what is done to Flask to support async await, it shouldn't break this. Uh, we shouldn't go around breaking people's setup, nor I think should it require major changes to their setup. So if we support it, I don't think we should go and tell people they've got to go and change the server they use, for example. So this is a big constraint. Not only that, I think you'll probably have heard of and perhaps be familiar with the async color problem, especially as it's a bit topical at the moment in the Rust community. So what it means is, say I have a sync function, or I can call a sync function very happily. If I have an async function, I can await an async function very happily. Everything's working. If I have an async function, I can call a sync function. That's great. Where it becomes problematic is if I have a sync function, I cannot await an async function. And if I were to just call the async function, I'd just create a coroutine object. So I wouldn't run it. Uh, so this is this is problematic. If I've got sync functions, as we do in Flask, because it was all built with sync functions, I can't really put async functions in. And it gets viral. So if we kind of summarize Flask looking a bit like this, I have a view function that calls something and returns the result. Then I have Flask that calls the view function. Then I have the server that calls Flask, please ignore this typo. Then if I were to want to await something now, the view function has to become asynchronous. What's more, Flask now needs to await the view function, which means Flask has to become asynchronous. And then we go back to the server. The server now somehow has to run this coroutine. So we use asynchronous run here. All the server itself has to become Asynchronous, please ignore this typo. So you can see this problem is viral. Like as soon as you want to start doing this, uh, using a weight in your view function, it kind of goes all the way back through. And going back to the first thing, this would require major changes to Flask and changing the server potentially. So this is a big problem. So I think it, it's fair to say that a fully async Flask requires changes to the server or, the, or middleware just to kind of break it up. That's hard. Uh, so to kind of give you a better sense of where this is painful. Let's take the current Flask class. This is what your app instance is. Now it's going to have a function in there called handle request. It takes a request, calls full dispatch request, which is going to call your view handler, gets the response and returns it. Now, if we were to make this async, we could do so just by adding a wait here. So we can await your view function and async here and another async there for the request context. Everything's quite good. However, Flask has for a long time encouraged extensions to override methods of the Flask class. And so for example, if we have this Flask extension that's overridden the full dispatch request, well, as far as this Flask extension is concerned, this is a synchronous function. So it's overridden it with a synchronous function. Now there's two problems here. If this tries to call any of the new asynchronous functions, it's not going to be able to. It's just going to create coroutines. It's not even going to break. It's just going to not going to do anything. 
Uh, but equally, whatever's calling this can't await it anymore because now it's synchronous, so it can't be awaited. So if we do this and make Flask async, we basically break a lot of the Flask extensions. So my view is that Flask cannot be fully async without breaking extensions, and it should not do that. All right, another difficulty for Flask, and this is, I think, a bit more specific to Flask as well, is that the request global creates a bit of a headache because of it, how it's used. So if we had, say, an app that could support synchronous routes and asynchronous routes, then uh, the view handlers in both cases want to get the JSON coming from the client. Well, getting JSON is an IO uh, type operation. It's coming from the client. So we want get JSON to both be synchronous for the sync routes and asynchronous for the async routes at the same time, which it can't be. So this is a bit of a headache for us. And uh, it's actually a bit easier for Django, as I'll, as I'll tell you in a bit. There's a headache for Flask. So it's my view that a fully async Flask must be namespaced differently. So to give you an idea of what I mean by that, let's say if we just added and prefixed A to everything that's async, uh, but left everything that's sync how it is. So we have A Flask and A Request. Now our whiskey app is Flask, our ASCII app is A Flask. Now we can have a synchronous handler that calls the synchronous request, everything works happily. And we can have an ASCII app, which has an asynchronous handler that awaits the A request. So this is an example of the namespace. This would work. And uh, yeah, I'll come back to that later as to why I think that's a good idea to think of it this way. Okay, so let's move on and ask, well, with all these problems in mind, how do we actually support async and awaiting Flask or how are we going to? Well, it's good to look and to start by looking at how Django supports it. So Django actually allows you to do what I think everyone wants to do, which is await something in a view handler. Now, Django also has this advantage I was mentioned earlier that you pass the request into the view. So Django can inspect the type of the view handler and pass in the right request, which is quite nice for them. But it doesn't really matter. I think for us, it's good to emphasize that you can do this. Now, it's also important to emphasize that this works with all existing Django setups. You don't have to go and change your server. You don't have to go and change a lot of your code. So how did they do that? Well, the clever thing they, they, they've done is to run each event loop on a different thread. So the main thread, as previously, runs the green-based event loop. Whereas on another thread, you run the asyncio-based event loop. And so to give you an idea of how, how nice this is and how clever it is, you start, let's say the main thread starts running green at one, which yields to, to when it does some IO, and so the event loop starts running green at two. Now the scheduler preemptively switches to the other thread. Now the asyncio event loop gets to run task one until it yields, say it needs to do some IO, and it keeps running task two. And this will carry on to either task two yields or the scheduler preemptively yields to the main back to the main thread. You see now we have exactly what we want. We're keeping the CPU busy and we're switching between tasks and greenlets if they're not blocking one another. So this is a really nice way. So this is conceptually how it works. I thought you might like to see a snippet of code how it works. It's not really important for the talk, but I think it's quite interesting. So the key thing is that we use some structures that work nicely with greenlet and concurrent futures and threads do. So the future, we just create a future that we're going to put the results of running the asyncio task uh, in. And so if we look at this in a run function, what we do is we create an event loop, we run the function that matters, the asynchronous function, and then we put the results in this call result or an error, if it errors, we close the loop. And that's that. So we just run that on a separate thread and we just wait for the results. And uh, yeah, so this is gonna work with uh, Greenlit as well. So it's really nice. And that, well, that's a bit of a snippet of it. The real library that does it is called ASCII ref and it powers Django and will now power Flask's 2.0's async support. You can find it here and it contains three crucial parts. This whiskey to ASCII adapter, which I'll come to in a bit, a function to take a synchronous function and make it async, make it awaitable, which I'm not going to talk about, and the async to sync, a function that takes a coroutine and makes it call synchronously callable. So that's the one we talked about here. So that's really nice. So what that will enable? Well, Flask 2 will enable this. So async view handlers, async 
before requests, after requests, error handlers, and teardowns, which I haven't shown here. And so, of course, you'd be able to await stuff here, which I think is really, just to emphasize, I think that's really what users want. They want to be able to await something in their code and uh, it just work with their existing setup. So Flask 2 will support async await alongside green that's using ASCII ref. And uh, I'll just emphasize the point again, what's really good about this is it should just drop in. You should just be able to just await something in your code and it works with your current setup. And that really is the key, I think, for Flask because of the constraints I spoke about earlier. So whenever I say this, I'm asked about performance. Well, uh, I'm going to say it's very tricky to confidently make any kind of accurate statement. And uh, I, I would gain a healthy skepticism about any of the benchmarks you see, uh, although I know it's very topical. One thing I think I can say with some uh, authority that FLAS async await support is unlikely to be performant as Quartz async await support, simply because Quartz not using extra threads and it's going to use an ASCII server directly. However, I also think it's quite feasible. This won't matter for your production app. It's that your business logic is going to dominate anyway. So uh, <laughs> maybe that you simply don't care that you can now use async await, which is great. And I think that's the point. So, uh, what I've shown you there is how Flask will support async await, but it's not ASCII, it's not fully async. So what about ASCII support? Well, I think it's important to note that ASCII servers can serve Flask apps. So you can switch to an ASCII server if you want to. You can use this whiskey to ASCII adapter that comes from ASCII ref, which is the one I'd recommend because it integrates very well now with Flask. Uh, simply wrap your app and then you can serve the ASCII app using Hypercorn, Uvicorn, Daphne, or any other ASCII server. This is all, it's all well and good. It doesn't mean though that Flask is an ASCII framework. What is an ASCII framework is Quart. And I said earlier, if you want Flask to be fully async, you need to namespace it. And that's how I see Quart. So Quart is the Flask API re-implemented using async await. So it should be exactly the same as using Flask, except you say Quart instead of Flask and you use async and await where you wouldn't in Flask. It has some additions. So for example, WebSockets are very asynchronous, so they make a lot of sense in Quart, less so in Flask. But inherently, I just want to emphasize again, I see it as the async namespace of Flask. And I think this gives, uh, well, before I go on to that, let me just emphasize that. I think I've emphasized it a couple of times, but there we go again. Quart is the Flask async await namespace. So the advantage of this, and where I think it's really great for users, is that I think they have a really good choice now. And I'll, I'll try and just describe it this way. You'll likely, perhaps, start with, or you may think about having a mostly synchronous code base, in which case, Flask is the right choice. Now, perhaps over time, you might add, or oh, for whatever reason, you might start using asynchronous code in Flask, which you can now do with Flask 2. So that's all good. You're kind of sitting here. Eventually, perhaps, you're now mostly asynchronous. So you're moving towards Quart. So now you can make a decision, I hope, just to change the names Flask to Quart and carry on as you were before. That's really what I'm hoping for. And then perhaps you go all the way and everything's now asynchronous, and then you're really in Quart's realm. Um, and perhaps you could start the other way. You start mostly async and then for reasons you want to actually go mostly sync. Now, I think this is a, a really good thing for users because they don't need to worry about the API changing if you go from async to async. They merely need to worry about like changing synchronous to asynchronous and just learning about that. So I think that's the great advantage. And I think, and this is my view alone, uh, this is as far as really you can go. I don't actually believe Flask can go fully async, but that's a topic for another time. So uh, I'll stop there and say, if you've got questions, please tweet me at PDG Jones. So remember that D. Uh, I'll also say that Flask 2 is due out in about a week. And you can, when it is out, you can install the async support using this extra. This is because we're still just checking and gaining confidence that the async support really does work with Greenet the way we expect it to and isn't going to break stuff for everyone. Or if you want to try it today, which I encourage you to do so you can help us out and tell us if there's any issues, you can use a pre-flag. And this works uh, as of right now. So thank you for listening and uh, yeah, please send me questions. <laughs>